But what I figured out was that Milt and his family were very, very wealthy. And the reason that they were so wealthy is that over a period of decades, he had raised money from individual wealthy friends of his, and he bought 80 buildings, 80 industrial buildings, 6 million square feet, and he had 130 tenants. And he was living an incredibly nice lifestyle. He, he had a nice car and he had a, a winter home in Florida and a beautiful condo in the city of Chicago where we live. And he had a house in a fancy suburb. And I thought he didn't make his money by being a leasing agent. If you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Connor. Are you wanting to raise private money for your real estate deals? Or have you wondered where to find private lenders and what to say to private lenders? Well, you're listening to the right show right now. My guest today has raised over $100 million and he's about to reveal his secrets on raising private money. My guest, Joel Friedland, is an industrial real estate entrepreneur and has secured over 2,000 leases and sales. This episode of Raising Private Money will amaze you and get you on the fast track to private money. Let's dive in right now. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority, also the host with you today, and I'm so excited to have my guest on today. You're really going to love this guest. First of all, he has raised over $100 million in private money, and he's got a 40-year track record in this very specific niche of real estate, which is called industrial real estate. Well, as an industrial real estate broker and owner, he has secured in his career over 2,000 industrial property leases and sales. Now, here's what makes my guest so successful. And that is because of his greatest accomplishment. And his greatest accomplishment is relationships, how to nurture relationships and how to maintain valued relationships now for over 50 years. He's going to share the secrets with us in just a moment. And you're going to be meeting my guest right after this, Mr. Joel Friedland. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you, Joel, you might just be winning the prize on raising, having raised more private money than anybody else I've had on the show. And I'm now into my fifth year of uh, the podcast here. So again, welcome to the show, Joel. Wow. A hundred million dollars in private money. We can't wait to hear that story as to how you've gone about it. But first of all, what in the world is industrial real estate? Well, Jay, um, if you drive on the tollway in just about any city and you go away from town, you see these gigantic uh, concrete industrial buildings. There's, there's glass on either end, and that's where the offices are, and there's a, a line of truck docks. Uh, that is an industrial building, and it's occupied by companies that distribute products. Uh, like Amazon and like Target and like Wayfair, uh, that's that's called a industrial real estate. That's what uh, pension funds and, and insurance companies invest in. Uh, I'm in a little bit of a different niche. We are in what's called B and C industrial, which if you go to any town in any country, there's an industrial park. That's where products are manufactured or distributed. And I'm in the business of knocking on doors in industrial parks and asking the owners if they want to sell their building and lease it back. And that's a way for them to raise some money to help them run their business and give them some liquidity. 
And I've been able to do that about 90 times. I've been able to knock on doors. I, I don't do it myself. My son was with me and I have other people who do it as well. So uh, companies manufacture products in our buildings. They make all kinds of products from safety products to the craziest one. Uh, there's a knife sharpener. They sharpen knives for restaurants uh, and all kinds of services and all kinds of products in, in industrial buildings. Well, you know, I've had a lot of uh, successful guests here on Raising Private Money, but I've never had an industrial real estate guy come on. So, and we're going to talk about private money here in a moment, but how did you get into this niche? Never, never met anybody in this niche. So I was in college at the University of Michigan, and I took a couple of courses that I really liked about real estate. And I decided that I wanted to be in the real estate business. I didn't know what industrial real estate was. All I knew is that I grew up in a house and my parents lived there since I was a little kid and they bought it. And I saw houses go on the market up and down the street. And I thought real estate was residential. Uh, and a very, very close friend of mine who I grew up with was in a jacuzzi with a, I would call him an extremely energetic guy who said, hey, I'm in industrial real estate and I'm looking to hire somebody. Uh, my friend knew I was looking for a job right after college and I went and met with this fellow. His name was Milt. And he said, I'm in industrial real estate. And I said, okay, what's that? And he says, warehouses. These are boxes. They're boxes that are a certain height and a certain size, and they're full of companies that distribute products and manufacture. And I said, that sounds great. He said, do you think you could uh, maybe do some leasing? And I said, as a kid, I used to cut lawns and I'd go door to door up and down the street and ask people if I could cut their lawn. If I saw an industrial building that was vacant, I'd go to the next door neighbor and I'd ask, hey, are you looking for space? Would you consider moving? And Milt says, you are hired. And I went to work trying to fill up his empty buildings in 1981. Interest rates were 17%. I remember. <laughs> it was a disaster. He had, he had a bunch of vacant buildings and he was really struggling. His vacancy is so expensive. You have to pay the taxes, the insurance, the maintenance, the utilities. And he was just desperate to find someone who could fill them up. And I jumped in and started right away. In my first uh, year, I made 37 leases for him. Woo! Well, door -to -door, he just door to door canvassing. Yeah. Well, uh, he knew that he had found uh, you were his godsend that year. <laughs> so, so that's how you got into it. But then you migrated over to this business model of buying B and C existing warehouses and asking, as you said, asking the owners if they want to sell, lease it back. So I doubt one morning you just woke up and said, you know, I think I'll go knock on some doors of people that own warehouses and see if they want to sell and lease it back. How did that, how did this come about? Well, what happened was uh, Milt had a family business. It was not my family, obviously, because uh, I just met him. He had a, a couple of sons and a daughter in the business. And for a number of years, I was an agent. I was a leasing agent for industrial properties. But what I figured out was that Milt and his family were very, very wealthy. And the reason that they were so wealthy is that over a period of decades, he had raised money from individual wealthy friends of his, and he bought 80 buildings, 80 industrial buildings, 6 million square feet, and he had 130 tenants. And he was living an incredibly nice lifestyle. He, he had a nice car and he had a, a winter home in Florida and a beautiful condo in the city of Chicago where we live. And he had a house in a fancy suburb. And I thought he didn't make his money by being a leasing agent. So I sat with him and I said, how'd you do it? He said, I'll mentor you and show you because you've helped me. I'm going to help you. So I went out and found a building to buy. And I said, Milt, I need to raise some money. And he said, I'll put in the first 300000 I'll introduce you to people who invest with me, but you've got to go out and find the rest. And that's how I got started. I love it. I love it. So that is a beautiful segue into talking about private money. So, and this is great having you on the show. All the private money that I use is for single family houses. You use private money. You've used private money for 
industrial, which is a lot higher price point, a lot higher, you know, um, uh, amount of funding that's required. But what I've learned over the years is that it's all the same money, regar regardless of the real estate, regardless of the asset. It's all the same money coming from the really the same kind of people. Now, people that I raise private money are actually not all that wealthy. I mean, like the people that I raise money for, I got 44 private lenders right now. Uh, about We only have like eight and a half million dollars that we are churning, you know, from project to project to project. And, you know, our median price on a single family house in our area is... Three hundred twenty-five thousand or so dollars, um, but even though the decimal point and the number of commas and the number of zeros is different, my guess is in your world of raising private money is very very similar to my world of raising private money as far as how we go about it. How do you find them? How do you begin the conversation, um, etc. I mean, you know, in my in my little world, uh, Joel. Um, I've never pitched a deal. I've never asked anybody for money. And they say, well, Jay, well, how you got all that private money? You never pitched a deal and you never asked anybody for money. Well, in my case, I put on my teacher hat. All 44 of our private lenders never even heard of private money, never even heard of private lending, never even heard of self-directed IRAs and how they can use their retirement funds to invest and have no penalty and at least earn money tax deferred. So I put on my teacher hat to teach potential private lenders by networking through my own network. And of course, my problem today is I got more money than I can use as far as, you know, from the investors. So, Joe, let me just open it up to you. Where do you find these people? Um, how do you start conversations? If you could sort of like break it down in a step by step method of how in the world do you raise $100 million in private money? That's a great question. I've got a, a number of things that I've done. It's not just one thing in my case, but when I did my first deal with Milt Podolsky, which was the, the fellow that was my mentor, um, he had raised money from wealthy folks. And my first money was really because he was my mentor and he introduced me to people. I was able to raise a few a few dollars from each of those people. I had five investors that I went to that Milt just gave me their phone number. He said, call these people, tell them you work for me. And then if they want to know if you're okay, I'll tell them that you are when they call me. So I went to the first guy and I said, I'm, I'm buying a building and Milt's investing. And that was enough for them. They heard that Milt was investing and that was it. So what I've learned is that the referral system, like what you're talking about, you, you meet people, you help them, then they want to come in with you. And one of the things that I've done is I've paid it forward. I'm an industrial real estate broker, which means I help companies uh, relocate and I earn commissions for doing that. And I advise them. And over the years, what happens is when, when I'm an advisor or a mentor, people just start to trust me because they see how how I think. They understand uh, where my judgment comes from. And they and I'm very vulnerable. I'm very honest. I've had bad deals. In 2008, I got crushed. Uh, I had raised private money from 62 separate individuals who completely trusted me. And I gave, we, we did promissory notes and I guaranteed a 10% return. And when the world came apart in, in the big uh, economic crisis in 08, I had 50 buildings that we had bought and we had 300 investors that I had assembled over a period of many years. And, it, and it's just a few people a month. It's, it, it, it never, it didn't happen overnight. It was just building and building this set of relationships. And when that went bad, what I learned is a don't guarantee loans. It just is death when bad things happen. I also had borrowed money to buy these properties from seven banks, Bank of America, Chase, and some local banks. And I was underwater and it was really, really rough. So you know what happens that works best for me is when I meet somebody new, often from one of my mentees, someone that I'm teaching the business to, they say, hey, can I introduce you to my dad or to my sister or my cousin? And I, I start with, I want you to know that everything I do is not a winner. 
And I went through a period in 2008 where I thought I had lost money for 300 people, including 62 people that I had guaranteed loans to. And because it was such a mess, I went into a depression. I went into a clinical depression. I was on a couch and could not get off. And to be honest with you, which is really important, the vulnerability, I was uh, about 40. My parents were alive and my wife uh, was living with me with this depression. And they sat with me so because they were worried that I might actually do something like go take pills. I was so distraught. And I, when I tell people that story, they just open up and it's like, that's refreshing that you're not the guy who goes out and kills it and everything works because that's not honest. And so once I open with that, <laughs> generally speaking, then they start asking questions and then I want to get to know them. So I think it was um, Dale Carnegie who says, interesting is interested. So I know so much about all of my investors. I take notes. I touch base with them. One of my habits is to talk to at least three investors every day. I mm -hmm. have to do it. It's a must. And they appreciate it. So you start, just to unpack what you said, you start by being totally honest with a new potential private lender. And you tell them up front, everything you do in life has some level of risk to it. And then, of course, I would imagine in your conversation, you talk about, well, how it is that I'm going to protect you and how it is that I go about mitigating risk. Joe, before you answer the question, how do you protect your investors? How, what do you do to mitigate the risk? I want to go ahead and give our listeners a gift for just tuning in today. And that is, I'm so excited about a recent private money guide that I've written. It's called Seven Reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate business and help you build incredible wealth. If you want to get on the fast track, like my guest Joel and myself have done and get a lot of private money rather quickly to where you don't miss out on any real estate deals, you can download this guide for free at www.jayconner.com forward slash money guide. That's J Connor, J A Y C O N N E R dot com forward slash money guide for the fast track to private money. Back to you, Joel. Um, how do you mitigate risk? Uh, what is it that you do in explaining to your private lenders uh, how you do everything that you can to protect them? Sure. I, I really think this is something that's an insight uh, that's, that's going to sort of take a little different direction than your question. But I think that the key to uh, mitigating is making really good decisions. It's doing great due diligence so that whatever we're investing in, I understand the downside and the upside. We looked at some properties a couple of months ago to buy that were occupied by a manufacturer right near O'Hare Airport in Chicago. And I had investors lined up. I actually had 40 something investors lined up and I was ready to do the deal. And I found some extremely detrimental problems with the property zoning uh, and with the property's geometry, the way that the trucks pull in and out of the uh, truck docks. And I made a decision, even though the money was raised, I decided it's just as a deal I can't do. And I told all the investors, I'm sending you your money back. We're not closing this deal. So the first thing is ask great questions and be ready to say no. That is really important. But the second thing is, uh, because of what happened to me in 2008, I'm afraid of debt. I don't mind being a lender, but I don't want to be a borrower. So we buy all of our properties, all cash, no mortgages, which means it's a lot more work. Because if you borrow 80% on a million dollar property, you can raise 200000 and it's great. When I buy a million dollar property with my investor group, we buy it for a million dollars, all cash, no mortgage. And we always over raise by about $100,000 on a deal like that, 10% to have reserves in the bank. So what I've learned is that this resonates really, really well with wealthy people because they're not looking to make a killing. They're looking not to lose all this money that they've made. And so I'll tell you the greatest story of all. 
Um, in 2007, before all that bad stuff happened, I went to meet with a local billionaire and his family, his wife and his three kids. And I was at their dining room table and I was trying to get them to invest a million dollars. And the first thing that this guy asked me was, uh, tell me about your worst deal. And I said, we've never lost money on a deal. And he looked at me and he said, we can be social friends, but this meeting is over. We're not investing with you. Why don't you come back to me when you've got some humility and when you've lost money because you don't know how to lose money. And that was prophetic because the following year was that bad year. So I would say that the answer is you got to be vulnerable and open. That's what that's been my my way of operating and just being incredibly honest with people and not trying to impress them. I don't need to impress them with a fancy car. I don't need to impress them with a fancy house. I, I just I want to be vulnerable. There's this writer uh, by the name of Brene Brown, and she talks about uh, shame and vulnerability. And I recommend that uh, anybody who's interested in this subject, look her up and go to the TED Talks and to the books. I, my whole story is I got to be vulnerable and people relate to that. Well, you know, my guess is when you told those 62 investors that you were going to be sending their money back and that you're not closing on that deal. If they didn't have a hundred percent trust in you prior to that, they had more than a hundred percent trust in you after that. I mean, what are some of the comments you got from those investors when you told them I'm sending your money back? Please let me know when you get the next good one. I'm in. Just yeah. Like I mean, the board. I mean, you I'm know, in. I mean, any, any unscrupulous Schneister would never send money back. <laughs> But we'll never send money back. And I experienced, I experienced the same thing uh, on a much smaller level than you. I will have, so I keep my private lenders in a queue. Um, I got 44 of them. And when we pay one of them off, then we put them back in the queue and, you know, we reinvest our money just as soon as we can. Um, but, you know, I mean, I've got a number, like yourself, I don't have, 40 years of relationships of private lenders, but I've been doing this private money thing with individuals since 2009. And, you know, I'll let them know that, Hey, I've got a, I got a deal under contract and uh, we're scheduled to close in two weeks. And then, you know, once in a while I'll call them up and I'll say, you know, uh, through some due diligence, that deal fell through, not closing on that deal, similar to your story. Or, you know, closing has been postponed, et cetera, not closing yet. Because one thing that I do is I never have my private lenders send money directly to my company. All the private money that we borrow is sent directly and wired to our real estate attorney's uh, escrow account. And then after closing, you know, funds are uh, dispersed. So, um, again, I mean... I don't know anything more valuable uh, than trust when it comes to private money and nothing's going to, you know, you know, lose that money for you or break that relationship. Uh, you know, when you, when you break trust um, tomorrow afternoon, I have a, a membership, Joel, called the Private Money Academy Membership. I do live Zoom trainings with the membership twice a month. And our topic tomorrow is potential private lenders' fears and why you need to know what they are, you know. Um, and of course, private lenders' biggest fears, like you just said a moment ago, was how can I make sure I'm not going to lose this money? <laughs> I've, I've worked all my life. What are, what are, what's a big lesson or some big lessons that you learned from that 2008 global financial crisis? Is there anything that you do different today that maybe you did in 2008? You're not going to believe this one. Yes, there is. Um, I am a strong believer that people who get successful in real estate uh, become addicted to making deals. And someone will say, I'm a deal junkie. You don't want to be an anything junkie. That, that's bad. So I believe that there's a tremendous amount of gambling 
which I consider to be impulsive behavior, making a decision to invest in something before you really understand it. And I have a system, it's called WAIT. It stands for two things. It stands for what am I thinking? And it stands for why am I talking? So it means wait, just don't jump into things. Um, that's been the thing that's helped me the most. Uh, I have a very close friend who is actually a compulsive gambler and he goes to Gamblers Anonymous. And he's shared with me a lot of their secrets. And I can tell you that I'm, I'm worried that my next deal might be a gamble and I'll do anything to make sure that it's not gambling, that it's a safe play. What am I thinking? Why am I talking? I write in a journal. I, I write why I'm doing a deal. I put the pros and the cons. And I look at it after writing it all down. And I read it the next day to make sure I agree with myself. Because I'm really talking to myself yesterday. And I want to make sure that I'm not making an impulsive decision. So that's pretty much my, my mainstay is I just am super careful. That, that's the key. Well, and you mentioned it uh, a few minutes ago as well. One of the best ways to mitigate risk is don't do the deal <laughs> unless it makes sense through the deal. And you got to know, I mean, as the real estate entrepreneur, you got to know what makes a good deal. Um, one thing that I practice and I have for years and one thing that I coach um, my clients on that raise private money the way I do, and that is emotions never make the deal. Emotions are never a good barometer as to whether you should do a deal or not. There's only one thing, one thing, at least in my world, and you comment, there's only one thing that makes the decision as to whether you do a deal or not. And it's the math. The math makes the decision. How about you, Joe? Well, I have a uh, fellow who has been an investor with me for 20 years. He's 95 years old. And he says, emotion is not how you make deals. He says, math is how you make deals. It's unbelievable that you just said that because that's exactly what he says. That is incredible. He must, he must watch you. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or maybe I watch him and, and didn't even know it. So I'm also interested, Joel, in knowing, like, what's this, what, like, what's the long-term plan, like, when you're in a deal? Like, is there an exit strategy? I mean, are you in it, like, you know, forever? Like, for, I'll tell you what's driving this question. Yeah. For example, single family houses. The majority of the houses that I do because of the market now, I'm typically in and out within about nine months. Uh, that does not build wealth. That gives you big checks, but that's a transactional business model. No transaction, no money. Um, that's why I've got another portion of my portfolio. We've got a number of houses on what we call rent to own to where people are living in them and we actually help them get ready for a mortgage. But that's, you know, that's a much longer, you know, much longer strategy. So what is your like? What's your hold? Like, what's your hold term? What's your exit strategy? Are you in a deal forever? Is it a three to five year deal? Does it depend on the deal? You run with that any way you want to. It depends on the deal. Uh, I have a deal um, that I put together in 1989. And we have a tenant that's the most fantastic tenant. It's called Feed My Starving Children. It's a 20,000 square foot building in Aurora, Illinois. They have seven locations. They raise $65 million a year. And they have uh, church groups and school groups uh, come over to pack food. That Then missionaries that, that are associated with them are finding places to bring it overseas to feed starving children. They've been in the building for a long time. We're making about a 9% cash on cash return. And there's no reason to sell it. First of all, we're going to have to pay a lot of taxes. So in that game you're talking about, about selling quickly, it's ordinary income, which means it's double the rate of tax on you're paying the government too much. On this one, we've owned it for, for all these years. There's no reason to sell it. And if an investor wants to get out of the deal with my 200 existing investors, I circulate uh, a memo that says, hey, John wants to get out of the Feed My Starving Children deal. It's a 9% return. Who wants to get in? And I create a little liquidity 
It's called Rule 144 in terms of securities. Our lawyer uh, taught us that. And you're allowed to do it as many times as you want, as long as we're not selling securities. We're just introducing one party to the other. So that's a that's a 30-something year hold. Last year, we went under contract to buy a property from the, the local uh, gas company, People's Gas. And a week after we went under contract to buy it, through my industrial real estate brokerage contacts, I found a company that processes pork that needed to be in that location and came to see it. The second week we were under contract, uh, the fellow said to me, I'd like to buy this instead of you. Can I buy your contract? And the price of the property was three point five million, and I said, "Yeah, you, you can have it for five million." And he said, "Okay." Uh, that was an ordinary income flip. We flip one out of every four, so we're, we do what you do with some of your residential. We don't intend to. It happens when it happens. It's an accident. It's a good accident. Uh, and by the way, the fellow who bought that building then invested with me, so now he's a long-term friend and investor, in addition to everything else. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, uh, Joel, my guess is we've got some listeners that either A, want to learn more about how to invest with you uh, and or B, want to learn how to do what you do. Uh, I don't know if you're open to either one of those, but if you are, um, let us know uh, how to get in contact with you and your team. Sure. Uh, we're at Brit Properties. Dot com. That's B-R-I-T-1-T properties.com. And our website uh, talks all about our all cash deals and how we're risk averse uh, and has uh, various different kinds of offerings actually that are in there. And I'd love to uh, talk to people who might be interested in our risk averse uh, way of doing business. And I, I love mentoring. Mentoring is my favorite thing. I love to give back. I learn more when I mentor than I do when I'm mentored. I know what you mean. So uh, yes, reach out to Joel. Um, you may be interested in being mentored by him in this world that he's been talking about. And or you might be interested in investing with his company. Uh, check him out at www.brittproperties, B-R-I-T, one T, brittproperties.com. And um, you can certainly tell by now, Joel is the kind of guy that's got character, vulnerability, takes the filter off and tells you like it is. Joel, parting comments. Thank you so much for being with me today. Jay, thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. Me too. Well, there you have it, my friend, another episode of Raising Private Money. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority. And if you found this episode valuable to you, then please uh, be sure and share this episode with your family, friends, colleagues. If you happen to be listening on iTunes, uh, touch those three dots in the upper right-hand corner and hit follow so you don't miss out. If you happen to be watching and listening on YouTube, then be sure to uh, tap that bell and subscribe so you don't miss out. Looking forward to seeing you on the next episode. I'm Jay Connor, wishing you all the best. Here's to taking you and your business to the next level. I'll see you right here on the next Raising Private Money. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jconner.com slash money guide. That's jconner.com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconner.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay Conner. <laughs>